Today on Leading Women. With her jet black bangs, statuesque height, and creative ensembles, Mirza Sison has always cut a striking figure both on the runway and in the offices of Summit Media, where she works as an editorial director. The fun, fearless female, who is most closely associated with the racy magazine Cosmopolitan Philippines, wasn't born that way. The once shy, bookish nerd channeled her skill and determination to be the person she wanted to be. A model in her 20s and an award-winning writer and editor in her 30s and beyond. Mirza Sison, fun, fearless female. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Leading Women. Thank you for having me. Mirza, let's do a bit of a throwback to the okay. to your uh -oh. early years. You know, <laughs> I, I understand that you um, studied at a very young age, graduated high school and, and college as well at a very young age. Please take us back to that time. I started grade school at age five, and then I skipped two grades, grade two and grade seven at Maria Montessori. And then, so I entered uh, high school, Manila Science High School at 11. Wow. Finished at 14, and then took up statistics in UP. Graduated at 18, and but at 19, started working in SG and company as a computer programmer. Oh my! So you could say my childhood was super fast track. What was that like? You mentioned yeah. fast track. So what kind of childhood did you have? Parang None. From your study, <laughs> you were just studying, studying. I had no childhood. And you, you were. You could say my parents expected a lot, yeah. and I guess they pushed a lot. Mm -hmm. And although I'm thankful, it was tough to not really have a childhood. So I was always, maybe it's also in my nature, I was always reading a book while the kids would play. And okay. I was always like in my own little world. But were you um, an introvert or an extrovert as a child? Did you play with playmates, your cousins maybe? Neighbors? Introvert. I was so shy that sometimes when my relatives would come to our house for parties, I wouldn't come out of my room. Because I was so shy with my own relatives. <laughs> oh my. So you can imagine. But I think I overcome everything when I entered college because I found a book, a book again, mm -hmm. called Shyness. Shyness. <laughs> Overcoming Shyness by Dr. Philip Zombardo, who is oh. like uh, an expert on shyness. And so it was a self-help book that made me overcome like what could possibly be an impediment to you know, social skills. So a book helped me get through it. Mirza decided to strike it out on her own at the age of 19 when she got a job as a computer programmer. But it was her plans to become a model that really took her parents by surprise. You left home at yes. an early age as well. Yes, I left home when I started working. Uh, my parents were a little bit shocked, but my father said he was secretly proud yeah. because one day I just announced to my mom, I'm moving out. And I'm taking my electric fan. Okay. And can I borrow the driver? <laughs> <laughs> and how did your mom feel? Was she, she sentimental? She was devastated. And she kept on trying to uh, convince me to come back home. But my dad said, let her, it will teach her independence. Mm -hmm. And it did. What made you think that you know, it was time for you to move out? Was it the uh, corporate world? It was always part of the plan. Maybe the indoctrination with American magazines okay. really like molded my, my thinking into... I knew I had to move out to learn how to be independent. I had decided already at a young age. Mm -hmm. I kind of freaked my parents out again when I announced after being a computer programmer that I was going to be a model. <laughs> and they're like, you always freaked them out. Huh? And they're, they're like, why did you study pa, di ba? If you're just going to be a model. And yeah. I said, no, no, no. This is important to me. This is something I want to do. I love fashion and I think this is something I want to do. They're like, okay. So how did they support you with that? They didn't really. They kept on saying, when are you going to 
snap out of this craziness and get their master's degree. But I'm like, no, 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 I'm gonna pursue this until uh, it's maximum potential. And I even tried modeling around the Asian circuit. Yes. How was the transition like? I mean, you, you mentioned, um, yeah. I'll just go back to that. Yeah. No childhood, you, you worked yeah. right away, and then yeah. you decided to leave home. Yeah. Now you're in the uh, modeling industry, yeah. the fashion it was, industry. It was uh, a very drastic change because from a very mental world, suddenly just physical success, depended on your looks and how you harnessed your looks into let's say photographs or runway shows but i always believed that it was a whole set of skills that you had to develop i mean maybe people might look down on it and say it's a superficial profession but it takes skill and it takes a certain amount of intelligence i think mm -hmm. to to make it in the modeling industry so and what what drew me to it was actually my love for fashion and photography because I felt that the model in a fashion photograph was a co-creator of a fashion photograph. And she was just not like a still subject. She had the input. And so that is how that was how I felt when I was helping create a beautiful fashion photograph. And maybe with that mindset, it helped me rationalize my new career choice. That must have been fun for yeah, you. Yeah, it was, was fun been. because it's a fun industry. It was like playing, I guess. There because I go. had no childhood. Mm -hmm. This was a career where I could actually play. Yes. And it was like, I guess, my second childhood. <laughs> of course, modeling, like any other industry, comes with its own particular challenges. Mirza, coming from a disciplined and cerebral background, took them head on and turned her individuality into a strength. What were the challenges that, that you faced? Um, of course, it was tough. During yeah. that time. Tough competition. As I said, you relied on your look, so you had to be in tip-top shape. You had to sacrifice a lot of things, like maybe staying out late, or this is pre-Photoshop, so you couldn't retouch eye bags, yeah. or you couldn't like really gain weight. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it was my early immersion into building your brand. But that's such a byword these days. Yes, build your but own in the brand. early 90s, you already had to know, well, if you wanted to succeed as a model, what is my competitive advantage? At the time, I was the only one with short hair, okay. which I chopped again in an impulsive decision because I wanted to look like Tina Chow. I don't know if you oh, know. yes, I know Tina. Tina yes, Chow, yes, yes. she was like my peg then. Yeah, and yeah. so I remember this uh, top commercial agent saying, Hmm, the problem with you is your hair. And then I think I very uh, smart alecky said, the solution is my hair, not the problem. <laughs> and true enough, I'd get booked for if they needed a short haired pixie looking girl, ako na yun automatically. So nagkaroon ng competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And you know, I never vied for mga uh, when every designers na yung style nila medyo Filipiniana, na dapat nakapasod, yeah. na mukhang dalagang Filipina, I never got booked for those. But I get booked for the weirder shows like maybe Jerry Katibak or mm -hmm. Junjun Kambe. As a model, I knew my brand well enough to push it in that direction and not try to blend right. among like all the more uh, typical looking models of that time. Mm -hmm. But who inspired you or or until this day, you know, who inspires you, who guided you, who mentored you? Or did you mentor yourself? Uh, uh, it's <laughs> a combination of reading a lot and maybe it's really reading all those reading, magazines yeah. and okay. you know you read about the world, you read about the world outside your own world, you read about countries outside of your country, industries outside of your own industry and you Meet a, meet a lot of people through reading about them and then maybe you have like little pegs here and there and then you kind of learn uh, early on. I want to be like this girl, I want to be like this guy. So it's, I think it's a constant process. As Mirza's modeling career was coming to a close, she began to think about what she wanted to do next. The love of the written word never left Mirza, and fortunately, she was able to combine journalism with her experience in fashion. 
you mentioned Summit um, Media. Yes. You're the editor in chief of Cosmopolitan yes. Philippines. Fun, fearless, female, fashion, food, fitness, Filipina. <laughs> Tell us about this. Uh, would you say it's a new uh, stint for you, being the editor in chief? Was it a uh, um, a strategy you also had from modeling now to being editor in chief. Well, in all my schools, I was always with a school paper, grade school paper, high school paper, college paper. I was always an editor of some sort. So mm -hmm. maybe that is also a foreboding of things to come. Mm -hmm. That later on, at the tail end of my modeling career, I said, "How can I write about the things that I love? And I love fashion, and I love writing. And an opportunity came up with the Philippine Star." And so the editor of the lifestyle section, Milet Manangkil, tapped me to write about fashion. I had a weekly uh, fashion article that she published. And my very first article was what, what really goes on backstage in a fashion show. Mm -hmm. So I was actually doing the show while writing about it. So I was actually also photographing the goings on backstage of the fashion show. Mm -hmm. And she liked it so much that she got me to write on a regular basis. And then this led to uh, a job in Preview, which we uh, launched in 1995. I was the first fashion editor of Preview. Two years later, the opportunity to edit Cosmo Philippines came up, and I was chosen to launch Cosmo in the Philippines in 1997. Mm -hmm. So that was 18 years ago. Let's go back to Cosmo Philippines. Curiosity, finding ways, how do you keep your readers interested and, and um, abreast with what's happening in the world. Not it's a challenge that. because it's 18 years old and the reader of 1997 has grown up and it is now her daughter who is reading Cosmo. So uh, although the mother and daughter are different, I think intrinsically at the heart of what they want in life, it's really the same, the same needs to find your way in life and live the best kind of life you can live. And what just changes is the environment. So now it's love in the time of social media, love in the time of selfies, and you just have to really be aware of what's happening around you. And I think very important is to feed on the blood of the young. My okay. staff at Cosmo is composed entirely of millennials. Okay. And the market is millennials, and so I'm always trying to pick their brains, trying to see what's going on with their lives and their friends' lives, and that's how we do it. What kind of an editor-in-chief are you with your millennials? <laughs> you have a different mindset on everything and anything that's going on. It's a little bit different now because uh, 18 years ago, my staff were my peers. Mm -hmm. They are closer to me in age, and so we were like, maybe like a barcada. Yeah. And then now I'm always uh, upset and devastated to learn that I am their mother's age. <laughs> it's How true. do you feel about that? It's 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 been hard to adjust, and I think I've been in denial for so <laughs> long. Like, what? Your mother is my age, and it kind of freaks me out. But I think I've really risen up to the challenge of trying to put myself in their shoes, put myself in in their uh, through their eyes, and see things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably kept me younger than I... <laughs> <laughs> what is it about the, the millennials that you enjoy the most and that you find fearless in them? For all the flack that they get about being self-entitled and lazy and too ambitious, I think there are a lot of positive sides also. Like, maybe they're self-entitled, but maybe they just know what they want at an early age. Maybe they always like to take shortcuts and the older generation calls them lazy, but maybe they just want to work efficiently. They just want the shortest, the shortest, to know the shortest path to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. Or maybe people think they have no respect for their elders, but maybe because they all, they all grew up where the parents said the more uh, friend style of parenting rather than authoritative style of parenting. And so it's a plus too because they're afraid of no one. They'll talk to higher ups like their peers. This can be off-putting for older people, but I think it's great too because they, they really have no fear. Mm -hmm. The Cosmopolitan brand has always been about bringing out the fun, fearless female in a woman. And a big part of the magazine is to provide sex-positive information to Filipino women. As the longtime head of the magazine, Mirza has seen a generational shift. 
let's talk about sex. Ah. <laughs> Here's a, a Cosmo Philippines or Cosmo, the Cosmo, the magazine in general is a very can be very sexual. Uh, how does the public public receive it? How mm -hmm. do they adapt to it? Mm -hmm. How do they like it? Mm -hmm. Well, there is sexual content, but that's not all there is. There is balanced content, including sexual content, but there's equal content in terms of careers and emotional issues and love and pop culture. And as for the sexual content, obviously it resonates with the readers or they would stop buying it mm -hmm. because the sexual content that Cosmo has is information empowering information that will empower their sexuality. It is information that they need to know, information about, of course, their sexual techniques and the physical aspects of sex, but there's also a lot of information of birth control, sexually transmitted diseases, reproductive health, and all these things are the things that every modern woman, every grown modern woman should know. And mm -hmm. I think it's essential monthly information that every woman should read up on. Mm -hmm. So after they read that, they have you have your um, yearly Cosmo um, Bachelor Bash. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> all the pent-up emotions of all the, your readers, <laughs> be it print or digital, come out. During, in September. In September. Yes. During the uh, the Men, Men, Men issue, mm -hmm. which comes to life in the Cosmo Bachelor Bash, where we have uh, a smorgasbord of hunks in what we call a boyfriend buffet. Okay. It's all in the spirit of fun. You could say it's a little bit of reverse objectification. And if it were in the reverse, if it were like men drooling over half-naked women, it's a different case. But when the half-naked men are parading down the runway with thousands of screaming women, I think it's a little bit more fun and maybe a little bit empowering. This could be debatable, but I think it's a fun experience that reinforces uh, our power as women who can express their desire for the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And the experience um, of reading Cosmo and reading FHM, the male gaze and the female gaze, difference and similarity and the emotions maybe on how they view uh, sexuality but in different formats. Yes, of course. For As I mentioned earlier, the sexual content in Cosmo is meant to benefit women uh, in leading fulfilling sexual lives. When women pose for the cover of Cosmo, how is it different? Uh, what kind of message is she sending? And I always like to say that whenever we have a cover shoot and we're coaching the cover girl, although she's wearing a sexy outfit, I always stress that uh, you are communicating with a female audience. This magazine will be picked up by women and so in your gaze, while you're posing for the cover, you are talking to a potential friend, like as if you're saying, it's not like you're seducing a man, but as if you're saying, hey girl, look at me. You can be like me. I'm sexy, empowered, fun, fearless. And so there's a difference in the gaze. Mm -hmm. If you look at the eyes on every, of the cover girl in every cover of Cosmo, she's reaching out to her fellow woman and inspiring them to be like her. Cosmo is 18 years old, started in 97, and now we're in 2015. The difference between the Cosmo reader during that time and now? The difference will lie in, uh, I think intrinsically, it's the same Filipina grappling with the same maybe cultural constraints or constraints of parental upbringing because of being raised as a Filipina in the Philippines, but maybe the environment is different. So also maybe in 97, she did get much exposure in terms of the information she needed to know. You really couldn't just Google sex or Google contraception and get an answer immediately. And so now the reader has much more access to information compared to 18 years ago, her counterpart 18 years ago. But what we need now, now there's like information available everywhere, but what Cosmo does is curate all this information. It can be confusing, like who do you believe? But Cosmo is a safe and frank venue for curated information that can help her get through life. How does the Filipina view sex, the modern Filipina? I think although she has access to a lot of information, she still falls prey to a lot of 
misconceptions and myths and which is very alarming in this day and age when I hear about accidental pregnancies or modern intelligent women getting STDs I wonder why it still happens when there is information because if you're informed you were empowered to make sound decisions about your life and so I don't know why this still happens. Sometimes, you know, they know it in their head, but they don't really apply it. And so there will be instances where they'll say, Di naman siguro, bahala na. Di naman siguro. So they don't really implement the theory. <laughs> and so I think to teach young women and men to be more segurista about certain small decisions that happen in their daily lives that could impact the rest of their life, that's as important as e equipping them with information. Mirza, the epitome of the fun, fearless career woman, surprised herself by getting married relatively late in life, finding joy in food and salvation in working out. Let's go now a little bit to your personal life, oh, if you don't mind. Sure. You had a beautiful wedding in Tuscany yes. just a couple of years back. Um, um, yeah, six years ago. There you go. Yeah. Um, what was that like? Did you think that um, it would happen? <laughs> Did I? Yes. Ever think I would get married? Yes, yes. I remember we, we used to talk and you know yes. everything was just steady. You were happy yeah. with everything that yes. was going on in your life. You were content, you know, you were at the top of your game. Yeah. I was prepared actually not to ever marry. And I had decided, I said, well, I'm very happy right now. If if uh, I never find anyone, I have my gay best friend, JR. Yes. <laughs> I'd be perfectly content. And so I was okay. And then I met. Andre Wisniewski, and he ruined my plans. <laughs> because when I met him, I said, oh dear, I guess I have to marry him. <laughs> so ganun pala yun, you don't know, you, you can decide for all you like, and you can plan your life, but yeah. I just knew that I had to. Mm -hmm. And so at 42, I married him. Nice. It's probably the oldest bride on the planet. No, but, of course not. <laughs> but I'm glad that I married late in life after having accomplished everything I needed to do and mm -hmm. having lived a full life. Mm -hmm. Because I think that makes it much better when you're okay with yourself and you're whole, I think. What is married life like now? It's great. I don't see any difference. <laughs> Sometimes I slip and call him my boyfriend and then oh, I sweet. remember that, oh, He's my husband na pala. <laughs> so I don't I don't see any change. Maybe it's just the security of the stability, but I think maybe it's just a mental concept. I don't see any change really. I think if two people are meant to be together, you can label their relationship any way you like, but it, it really doesn't matter. But what matters is your love for food. You share this love for food. I see it on your feed. You travel. Fortunately and unfortunately, I married a restaurateur. And so, on the plus side, there's a lot of free food. On the negative side, there's a lot of free food. But both of you work out a lot. You're into fitness. I wouldn't say both of us. Okay. So, ikaw lang ba? Yes. Okay. So, Tell us about that side of you that um, we see a lot these days. We know that you know you're a brilliant writer, you're a brilliant model, you're on top of your game as an editor in chief of Cosmopolitan Philippines. How about in the fitness department? <laughs> I'm sure you excel as well. I think fitness has become my salvation and catharsis. It really helps me distress, and I really feel like. If I can control working on the fitness of my body, mm -hmm. I can control other aspects of my life. And so, it's really a part of my daily regimen. I wake up at 6 and then a trainer comes and then I work out maybe 4 to 5 times a week. Mm -hmm. Without fail, wherever I am in the world, I've made it a part of my ritual as if along the other daily rituals like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom, I've tried to integrate it into my life so that I never skip a workout. <laughs> Did you ever have body issues? Definitely, and I still do, especially in the modeling world. It's tough because you're really judged on your appearance and if you can't fit into a certain garment, you don't go down the runway and it happened to me. 
a couple of times. And so this is like daily agony. And so I know exactly what it's like to have body issues. Mm -hmm. And how do you um, help all your readers mm -hmm. overcome their body issues, accept who they are and what their, their body has become? Uh, as they say, it takes one to know one. So because I know exactly how this feels, I think it has placed me in a better position to help others. Mirza Season is loving the skin she's in, a life of books, beauty and being brave about what she wants has made her life a very fulfilled one so far. Yet the editorial director keeps her curiosity alive and looks forward to exploring other passions and talents that she harbors. After all, learning is a constant process.